The sun rises on an old plantation house. Sunbeams reflect off its glass windows and light up its white siding and brick foundation. Slowly, the light of the dawn begins to stream into the rooms of the house and scintillate playfully on the polished wood of the antique furnishings. This house has stood for many years and has witnessed numerous changes. This family home has watched children grow up and begin families of their own. It remembers the days when covered wagons carried settlers west on the wilderness road. It recalls watching as men discuss the founding of a new nation and it has seen the expansion of that nation. This house looked on as the wilderness around it was transformed into farms and villages and later into towns. It witnessed the founding of a small college and watched that college mature into a large university. This house is Smithfield Plantation. When William Engels chose to start his family at Draper's Meadows, in the southwest Virginia backwoods, he was doing more than merely deciding on a pretty spot to live. He was daring to settle down on what was then untamed and even dangerous frontier country. And to some minds, he was also encroaching on land that had already been claimed. For ignoring this important detail, William Engels and the other settlers of Draper's Meadow would pay dearly. In July 1755, William was absent from Draper's Meadow when it was attacked by Shawnee Indians who were trying to protect their hunting grounds from settlers. He returned too late and discovered that his wife, Mary Draper Angles, his sister-in-law, Betty Draper, and his sons, Thomas and George, had all been captured by Shawnee. Four months later, Mary would escape from the Shawnee and make the arduous 800-mile journey home. Adam Harmon, a neighbor of the Angles was the first to encounter Mary on her way home. She stayed at his house for a few days until she was strong enough to return to her own home and to her William. Young William Preston, a surveyor's apprentice, however, would discover a different ending to this tragic story. He was on an errand to Sinking Spring on the day of the Draper's Meadow Massacre, while his uncle, Colonel James Patton visited the families at Draper's Meadow Settlement. Preston returned to discover that his uncle had been one of the massacre's many casualties. Despite the tragedy that occurred here, Colonel William Preston, appointed as surveyor of Montgomery County, would return and build a plantation in this area less than 20 years later. Because of this, he became known as a leader of the westward expansion. Not everybody, however, thought it was a good idea for Colonel Preston to move his house to the frontier. His brother-in-law, the Reverend John Brown, wrote to him, I can assure you I am in no way satisfied with your situation. You lay too much in the way of the Indians. New River has been the course they came formerly to war, and probably will come. You had need to be upon your watch and take every prudent method to prevent a surprise. You have a great number under your care whose dependence for protection is upon you, a loving wife and a number of helpless children. One critical artery of westward migration during the late 18th century was the Wilderness Road. This road was primarily carved in 1775 by the well-known frontiersman Daniel Boone. Originally called Boone's Trace, this westward route had its origin in buffalo hooves and natives' feet but much of it still had to be literally cut through the wilderness. Beginning at Fort Chiswell in the Shenandoah Valley, the wilderness road wound through the valley and then west across the Appalachian Mountains and through the Cumberland Gap into the Kentucky Bluegrass region and on to the Ohio River. This westward route was officially named the Wilderness Road in 1796 when it was widened to more easily accommodate Conestoga wagon travel. By 1800, more than 300,000 settlers had journeyed the Wilderness Road. Most of the houses on the edge of the frontier were log cabins, but Colonel Preston's house was quite different. His plantation of nearly 2,000 acres 
in his aristocratic home were a statement of his great wealth. Smithfield, which Colonel Preston named after his wife, Susanna Smith, was built in the 1770s. Because of its style and large size, other homes like it would be seen only in large eastern cities like Williamsburg. Smithfield was a, a tremendously important site uh, for the development of westward expansion and Colonel Preston had the idea that he wanted to show that he could survive as a wealthy landowner on the edge of the frontier at that time. Uh, and so that's why he built this house as elaborately as he did to show that he was wealthy, that he could survive out here, that he could actually thrive here uh, on this land. Because Smithfield Plantation was at the edge of what was then the frontier, it had to be self-sufficient. This meant that the Prestons and their slaves had to create a self-sufficient farm. They grew all their own food and made their own blankets and clothing. The plantation included not only a large plantation house, but also slave quarters, barns, smokehouses, workshops, and other outbuildings. Without the labor that the slaves provided, this large farm would not have been feasible on the frontier. Slaves um, were a crucial part of the um, building of Smithfield, as well as taking care of the property, attending to the children, um, crops, cooking. Um, they were an integral part of um, the making of Smithfield. William Preston, along with his wife Susanna and seven children, moved to the plantation in the spring of 1774. At the time, their new home was not yet complete. Because of the threat of attacks by the Shawnee and the upcoming revolution, William Preston surrounded his home with a 14-foot high stockade fence. Colonel Preston wrote of the defense of Smithfield. Smithfield is now almost a frontier, and my family are much exposed. The neighbors have joined me to build a little fort for our defense. I'm standing in front of a stockade fence that we used to represent, a fence that would have been here when the Prestons built this home. Now they did this, we know, because of a letter that one of their daughters wrote uh, as a recollection of her life here at Smithfield. And she specifically said that they had built a fence around the property to protect them from the Native Americans. And at the time, this was the edge of the frontier, and so there was a real threat that the Native Americans would attack this area. Uh, and so as a means of protection, they built a fence that would have been much taller than the one I'm standing in front of, uh, but this is our way of representing the protection that they needed. In May of 1778, the governor of Virginia authorized a sergeant and 12 men to be stationed at Smithfield. To induce you to remain at your habitation and encourage others to do so. Behind the fence, the Preston family moved in and began to make themselves at home. Five more children were born to Colonel Preston and Susanna while they resided at Smithfield. There is no known portrait of Colonel William Preston. However, his daughter Letitia said of him, Colonel Preston was above the ordinary height of a man, 5 feet 11 inches. He was large, inclined to corpulence, was ruddy, had fair hair and hazel eyes, his manners were easy and graceful. He had a well-cultivated intellect and a fine taste for poetry. I remember reading several beautiful productions of his addressed to my mother in praise of her domestic virtues. William Preston was born in December 1729 in Londonderry County, Northern Ireland. He moved to Virginia with his family in 1738. Susanna Smith Preston was born on January 23rd 1740 in Hanover County, Virginia. She married Colonel Preston on July 17, 1761. They lived first at Greenfield Plantation near the present day Fincastle, Virginia, before moving to Smithfield Plantation in 1774. Colonel Preston and Susanna lived in Smithfield for nine years. While living in Smithfield during the Revolutionary War, Colonel Preston not only actively engaged in the protection of his family and the rest of the frontier, but he continued his responsibility as a surveyor. On April 13, 1781, he wrote to Thomas Jefferson, I believe it my duty to order out all the militia 
I could raise. 